Thank you very much for taking our time and joining me in the day one of our Azure uh, security series uh, session. Today's session is the day one, and today we'll be talking about some of the fundamentals of Azure security. Before I get started with the session, I just want to make sure that everybody is able to hear me clearly. So I would appreciate if everybody can participate in the poll and let me know if you are able to hear me loud and clear. Okay, I see everybody is able to hear me clearly. Thank you very much for participating in the poll. Uh, before we begin uh, and going through the details of the session, I just wanted to understand a little more about uh, the people who have joined in. Uh, let me first introduce myself. Uh, my name is Roshan. I work with Ingram Micro as a solution architect. I've been a Microsoft person throughout my career. Uh, I started working with Microsoft uh, back in 2008, and um, I worked as a technical consultant helping uh, partners based in UK and Ireland. Um, and the technology that I started was uh, with SharePoint. Uh, it was called as MOS 2007 or SharePoint 2007. Uh, where I helped partners transition from 2003 to 2007. And then I later worked on 2010 and 2013, 2016. Um, SharePoint also is a technology that integrates with a lot of other solutions like Active Directory and Exchange and uh, security services. So that gave me exposure into a surrounding technology. And that's how I transitioned to Office 365. Uh, worked a lot on Office 365, did several migrations from on-prem to uh, Office 365, both Exchange and File Server. Uh, worked on BPOS and, and Office 365, so both the 2010 version and the 2014, which is the current one. And then I started working on Azure. Uh, so my initial days of Azure was uh, deploying SQL Server, uh, deploying um, directory services and ADFS roles for uh, Office 365 uh, for, for the authentication purposes. And that slowly started expanding more and more into uh, infrastructure as a service services. So uh, currently I work, uh, work with partners in helping them design and deliver solutions around Azure. Uh, it can be uh, right from lift and shift or even modernization where we use uh, containerization technology or serverless like Azure Functions. Um, I also help partners uh, create a roadmap for their customers and help them through that journey of moving to cloud. So uh, it can be introducing bits and pieces of cloud, like you can start off with backup and disaster recovery, then move your non-critical applications, move your critical applications, and then do monitoring and optimization of, of those services. Um, I am an Azure uh, certified administration architect and a trainer. Uh, apart from Microsoft, I do work on other uh, cloud technologies such as AWS and IBM Cloud. Uh, I also have a lot of interest around business continuity and disaster recovery technology. So I work with vendors like uh, Veeam, Commvault, uh, DoubleTake, uh, Veritas, and things like this. So I have worked with partners. I have worked with Microsoft, and currently I'm working with Ingram Micro, which is a value-added distributor. So. I understand the channel model and hopefully these webinar series will help you get uh, a more detailed knowledge on Azure security features and functionality and help you devise your own offerings and solutions to the market. So that's about me. Uh, I would appreciate if everybody can participate and let me know what is your current role. Uh, are you from the sales, from the technical, are you from the IT support team? Uh, just just so that I can uh, tweak the session, tweak, uh, tweak the uh, demos and presentations according to the people who have joined in. Okay, uh, thank you very much everybody for participating in the poll. Uh, I see there's, there's a good mix of, I would say, technical pre-sales and help desk. Um, that is, uh, uh, these are the people for whom the session is actually built for. So I will be talking to you uh, more from a technology standpoint. So this session is not sales or marketing, it's very technical focused. 
and um, we will be looking at the various security aspects, right, from identity to network security to um, uh, security center, now known as Defender to Sentinel. So there's a lot of uh, security services available within Azure, and we have broken that down to four days and uh, 60, 60 minutes each day. Uh, and hopefully I'll have a lot of questions towards then. So I've kept about 15 minutes extra. And um, uh, feel free to post your questions on the Q&A or the chat throughout the session. I'll be reviewing those questions uh, uh, during the demo or post the demo and uh, hopefully answering them as well. Uh, one last question that I have is I just want to know, and this is more from uh, the people who have been working on Azure, uh, are you a certified Azure administrator? So have you cleared the AZ 100 or 400 exam? I'm sorry, AZ 100 or 104 or 400. Okay. So thank you again for participating in the poll. So I see most of you have not uh, taken up this exam. I would strongly encourage you to uh, take up this exam. Now, some of the pieces that we'll be discussing today will fall into this exam as well. Uh, but this course is uh, primarily designed uh, for audiences who already have a good knowledge on Azure. Right, so uh, though you may not be certified, I'm assuming you have been working on Azure, you have been doing migrations, you have been setting up virtual machines and network and things like this. Uh, so even with that knowledge, uh, this session is for them. Uh, also, if you are a security engineer or you have a back, or you have a uh, background on working with Cisco and um, let's say firewalls, uh, things like these, and you want to now start getting into uh, Azure security you will definitely see a, a wealth of information coming in and definitely for support engineers. If you are part of managed services team where you are supporting your uh, customers uh, in break fix issue, troubleshooting issues, you will definitely uh, get a lot of information in terms of how each component work with each other, how do they integrate, where do I look for information? So all of those things I would be covering. The outcome, uh, is, the expectation is you will get a good understanding of Azure security. And the course material is derived from AZ 500 exam. So uh, the, the way I've, I've created this, uh, the content and the topics is uh, uh, taking AZ 500 uh, material as a reference. And uh, if you are preparing for it, then definitely this, uh, this series will help you uh, 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 get enough information. So think think of the series as a as a crash course for for uh, AZ five hundred exam. Right, that's the simplest way to put it. So uh, quickly moving on to the agenda. So uh, this is what the agenda looks like. So we'll start off with uh, the most famous uh, service of Azure, which is Azure Active Directory. Then we'll look into identity and governance, and then we'll end with privileged identity management and hybrid security. So today's session is all around user identity, right? How does identity flow within Azure? What are the various components to manage identity? Uh, and how can I make sure that I have the reporting, the analysis, uh, the, the conditions around identity to make sure uh, I have a secure infrastructure? Uh, so uh, I have a quick question from one of the attendees. Will the session be recorded? The answer is yes, the session is being recorded and uh, you will receive the recording of the session uh, once it's completed. So to get started, what is Azure Active Directory? I'm sure most of you have been working on Office 365 or Microsoft 365 or uh, Dynamics 365, right? Any of these Microsoft Cloud technology, when you create a user, whether you directly create it on Office 365 or you create it in your Active Directory and then move that to uh, Cloud, it eventually gets stored into Azure Active Directory. So Azure Active Directory is the Microsoft's multi-tenant identity management service, right? It is one global service that is spread across the globe. So uh, Microsoft has today about 60 regions. Azure Active Directory is a service that's available in every region. So it's a global service 
that's spread across all the regions. And a lot of services use this, not just Microsoft. Azure Active Directory can actually integrate with other uh, software as a service technology. For example, if you're using Dropbox, if you're using Salesforce, if you're using Box from IBM, Azure Active Directory has the ability to go ahead and authenticate to these services, right? Uh, this is the storage repository for your users and groups in Azure. And do remember whether it is Dynamics 365 or Microsoft 365, the identity management for both of these is being provided by Azure AD. So uh, in the future, if you have a customer who is already on Office 365 and then wants to start, let's say migrating some of his virtual machines to Azure, remember that he already has an Azure account because he's using Office 365, Microsoft 365. So his Azure subscription is already ready. All you need to do is enable it and then just move his, let's say virtual machine or application or move his backup into the same subscription so that his Active Directory can be uh, reused. The usernames can, can, can uh, exist with each other. Now, what's the difference between Azure AD and Windows AD? Right. Uh, yes, uh, Azure AD definitely provides user uh, username and password. You are able to edit some of the properties of users. But how different is it when you compare it with a normal Active Directory running in an on-premise infrastructure? Right. Now, Azure Active Directory is uses uh, HTTP or HTTPS for communication. So, what does that mean? Is you cannot have application authentication to Azure Active Directory over NPLM or Kerberos. So if your application uses Kerberos authentication, then you cannot directly authenticate that with Azure AD. You have to have applications that use either OAuth or SAML or OpenID connection for it to work with Azure AD. So Azure AD, think of Azure AD as a directory for a software as a service application, right? Most of the software as a service applications in today's market work with SAML or WS Federation. And these are the authentication types which Azure Active Directory understands, right? Also, Azure AD is a very flat structure. So uh, if you again compare it with an on-prem Active Directory, in your on-prem Active Directory, you can create OUs and you can have uh, groups or multiple OUs and you can have OUs within a OU. So we can have all those uh, layers or structure created. With Azure AD, it's a very flat. You can just create users or you can just create groups. There's no concept of uh, organization unit or for that matter, there isn't even a concept of group policy object. So you cannot directly create a group policy object on Azure Active Directory. So these are some differences to, to remember uh, and, and think of. Now, talking about some of the questions which I regularly receive from partners, and, and I, I do have these questions in the upcoming slides for various topics. These are, uh, think of it that frequently asked questions that I usually get on during my interaction. The first question that I always get is, can I join a Windows 10 machine to Azure AD? The answer is no, you cannot join unless you enable another service on Azure AD known as domain services. Only when you enable domain services, you can join. Now remember, there's a difference between registering a Windows 10 and joining a Windows 10, right? Registering, you can definitely register a Windows 10 to Azure AD so that you can push your uh, MDM-based uh, policies to it, right? Um, but you cannot join the machine to a domain. For example, if you cannot create group policy, you cannot say, I want to block USBs in Azure AD as a group policy and push that to uh, Windows 10 unless it is joined to Azure AD domain services. Uh, we have already answered the second question. Can I create and manage group policies in Azure AD? The answer is again, no, you cannot go ahead and create and manage group policies directly on Azure AD unless you enable domain services. Okay, so let's look at what is this Azure AD domain services. 
So we looked at Azure AD and we saw that there are uh, the authentication type it uses is uh, over HTTP and HTTPS, which is OAuth based authentication. If you want Azure AD to uh, work with Kerberos authentication or NTLM authentication, if, you, if that is a requirement for your application, then you have to switch to Azure AD domain services. Uh, for example, uh, a simple example, let's say uh, you move a, a, a virtual machine, uh, a Windows virtual machine, or you set up a Windows virtual machine and put files in that virtual machine. And if you want the Azure AD users, right, have access to this files and folders inside that Azure virtual machine, right? Can you just use Azure AD for it? The answer is no, you cannot. You have to enable Azure AD domain services, make sure the Windows Server machine on Azure is joined to this domain services, and then you can have the users have NTFS permissions on those folders and files. So basically act as a file server, right? That, that's the simplest example of how I can explain domain services. Uh, so what it does is it basically converts Azure AD into directory as a service. So now it becomes a managed active directory running in Azure where you can uh, go ahead and uh, have uh, group policies created. You can push those group policies across machines and devices. Um, it automatically synchronizes. So any users which are part of Azure AD also by default become part of Azure AD domain services, right? and you can join your Windows 10, whether it is running in Azure or running on-prem, uh, you can actually join machines to uh, Azure AD domain services, right? So it, it basically extends the, the centralized identity uh, into Azure, and it's actually uh, one of the services that are, that are frequently used in lift and shift strategies. Uh, it's very simple and easy to deploy. I'll, I'll quickly show you a demo uh, of it, uh, the the setup is a couple of clicks. It takes about 45 minutes for it to become ready, uh, but it's very simple and easy to do. Uh, and then you can actually manage Azure AD domain services like an on-prem Active Directory. Again, about that, I'll, I'll quickly show you that. Your on-prem uh, SIDs, user SIDs are also synced. So uh, it definitely uh, makes sure that the SID history is taken care uh, your, uh, you can create custom OUs uh, and you can even administer DNS. So all of these things will now become possible with domain services. Another quick question that I typically uh, receive is, is Azure AD domain services included in Azure AD plan one or plan two? So uh, let, before I go ahead and answer this, uh, I appreciate if, if the attendees can participate and let me know, what do you think? Is it included in plan one or is it included in plan two? You can use the chat and just type out your question. Is it plan one or plan two? What do you think? Okay, so I see some of the people are saying plan one, some of the people are saying plan two, some are saying it's free, some are saying it's neither. So let me go ahead and, and post the answer. So it's actually not included in any of the plans. So like I explained earlier, it's an add-on service. So it is something that you have to purchase, even if you have an Azure AD plan one, and if you require domain services, it's a separate service. It's a separate add-on on top of it. It's not included in plan one or plan two, right? It's a separate add-on that you have to purchase on top of uh, Azure AD, whether it's free Azure AD, whether it's plan one or plan two, it's, it's an add-on feature. I have another question here saying, is there a clear migration path from on-prem AD to Azure AD domain services? Yes, there's a very clear migration path. So. The migration, if I take a step back and go to the previous slide, if you can see here, uh, let me use a highlighter. Just a second. Okay. So if you see here, this is your on-prem active directory. 
right? So you are syncing your on-prem Active Directory to Azure Active Directory using Azure AD Connect. So this is the normal service which you use to sync your on-prem uh, uh, your on-prem Active Directory to Azure. AD. The typical, whether it is Office 365 or Azure for that matter. Once it once the users are part of your Azure Active Directory. All you need to do is enable the service. And this piece I will show in the demonstration of how you can enable domain services. So as soon as you enable domain services, everything which is in Azure AD is automatically, like it says here, automatically synced with your Azure AD domain services, right? So this is how the, I would say the, the movement of the identity or the migration of the identity can take place. Uh, Joel, I hope that answers your question. Okay, so we looked at Azure AD uh, and domain services and how different it is with uh, Windows uh, Active Directory. I quickly want to touch about multi-factor authentication before we jump on to the session. I'm um, sorry, before we jump on to the demo. Now, multi-factor, I'm sure uh, everybody is very well aware. Uh, this is uh, possibly the most easiest and the most important security feature that has to be enabled for each and every cloud user. If you have not enabled for your company or for your customers, I highly recommend to go ahead and enable multi-factor authentication for each and every user. 80% of cybersecurity threats can be um, overcome by just enabling multi-factor authentication, right? So what is multi-factor authentication? It's an additional factor apart from your password to identify a user. So typically uh, every user is identified using his username and password, right? Uh, it's just one factor uh, considered, which is his password. But with multi-factor, there's another factor coming into place. It can be an SMS sent to his phone, a call to his mobile phone, or even biometrics. Uh, nowadays you even have uh, fingerprint scanners, which actually can work with Azure Active Directory and Azure Multi-Factor Authentication Service to go ahead and recognize that user. So again, I stress, make sure if you have not enabled, go ahead and enable multi-factor authentication. Now, if you're using Office 365 or Microsoft 365, any plan, multi-factor authentication is a free of cost service. So please go ahead and make sure uh, for your own organization and for your customers, multi-factor authentication is enabled. So let's jump on to a quick demo. Uh, so what I'll do is, uh, let me go ahead and share my screen here. And I'll quickly show you some of the items which we just spoke about, which is uh, multi-factor authentication, I'm sorry, multi-factor authentication, Azure AD and domain services. Uh, before I start doing that, uh, can some of the attendees confirm if you're able to see the screen sharing? Okay, thank you very much uh, for letting me know. So uh, this is the normal Azure uh, uh, portal uh, that, that most of you um, I hope are familiar with. Uh, so for Active Directory, uh, for, or to check Azure Active Directory, it's a service. So if I click on Azure Active Directory, um, you can see my role here, uh, the license which I've been assigned, my tenant ID, my uh, domain. So all these things are available. Uh, the, the first overview page is a very high level page. It shows you the number of sign-ins. It shows whether I'm being synced from my on-prem Active Directory. So uh, my Azure AD Connect uh, has been working and uh, it was last synced one hour ago. So this is a very brief information that it shows uh, on, on the overview page. If I click on users, this is where you can go ahead and create and manage your users. I can create a new user by clicking on the new user button. And this I can create uh, very similar to how I create an on-prem active directory. Uh, if I have multiple domains registered, I can choose which domain name he should have. So I have a couple of uh, custom domains which I've registered and these I can use by default. It will always be something.onmicrosoft.com. So that something is, is it either your domain name or, or the name which you used in order to go ahead and create your tenant. Right? Uh, so it's pretty simple, straightforward. You can go ahead and pre, uh, assign him groups. Groups are basically the Azure uh, Azure Active Directory groups which you have. Now these 
Some of the groups are synced from on-prem. You can also go ahead and create your group on Azure. So like I said, Azure AD is very flat. You can create users, you can create groups and add users into groups, that's it. You cannot create OUs, you cannot uh, go ahead and have a, a, a hierarchy created within Azure AD, right? Now, what is uh, a guest user or invite user? So invite user or guest user is basically a user who's not part of your company. So let's say um, you're collaborating with another company on a certain project and uh, they probably have their own Azure uh, or they may not even have Azure, right? So you just uh, are collaborating with the other company and you want some of the users of um, the other company to uh, have access to some of your resources, let's say the virtual machine or an app service which you have deployed. So you can go ahead and invite them. So this can be uh, something like Roshan at gmail.com, for example, their email address can be this, right? So you put in their first name, last name, and invite, and you can also put into their roles. Now, groups, like I said, is an Active Directory group. Role is an Azure role, right? So if you see, if I click on user, these are the inbuilt Azure roles. So some of these roles, for example, one of the most famous one is global administrator. So if I put this guest user part of global administrator, he pretty much has access to anything and everything within my Azure, right? So uh, I can assign him, uh, I can put him as part of group, I can put him as part of users and invite him. Now, users and uh, whether it is a user part of your own organization or you're inviting user, there is no charge associated with it. So you can have n number of users uh, as part of your group unless you have an, a premium plan one and two, and then you start assigning those, that is when you get built. But just for a user creation or just for Azure AD as a service, there's no chart associated to it. Okay. Again, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to use the chat or the Q&A uh, and uh, ask me your questions. Uh, we, uh, we looked at users, I'll quickly go through groups. Uh, so. Uh, it's it's like uh, how you create groups within Azure, uh, sorry, within your Active Directory. You can either create a, a distribution group or a security group, right? For Azure, what makes sense is a distribution group. I'm sorry, what makes sense is a security group. Distribution group is more for M365, right? Um, so you can create a group, give it name, add owners, add members, uh, and, and you can um, go ahead and make sure you can have dynamic groups where based on a user property, the user gets automatically added into this group. That is also possible, right? So membership type, if you see here, it has dynamic user. So let's say if you want to create a group saying every user whose department is equal to sales, automatically should be added into this group. That is what a dynamic user is. Assigned is you manually add that user. Dynamic device is again similar based on a device property. So you can say if the operating system is Windows 10 uh, or Windows Vista or Windows XP, right? If any of this, then it goes into this group called as Windows devices. Uh, so you can create those uh, queries or rules and uh, have, that, have those properties mapped to the users and they get part of this particular group, okay? Now, uh, coming on to the next uh, piece of demo, which is Azure AD Domain Services. Like I said, Azure AD Domain Services is a feature on top of Azure AD. So if I search for Domain Services, Azure AD Domain Services, right? So this is the wizard where you can actually go ahead and create Azure AD Domain Services. So uh, remember, for one subscription, you can have only one managed domain services or Azure AD domain services. You cannot have multiple. For example, I've already created one. So if I go ahead and click on new or click on create, it'll actually give me an error saying I cannot go ahead and create additional because one already exists as part of my subscription. So for one subscription, you can have only one domain services. But if you click on new, go through that wizard, it's like about three to four steps of wizard. Once created, how does it show you? So this is what it shows. So if you look at the properties, it is it is hosting its own DNS. It has its DNS IP addresses. 
it has its own virtual network and uh, network security group so think of it as an azure uh, as a windows ad running in the background and you are using this web interface this web interface to actually manage it right but at the same time you do not see an option to go ahead and create ous go ahead and create group policies over here so how do you actually do it so what you can do is since this particular domain services has created its own network right it has its dns it has its its, its uh, subnet you can actually go ahead and add a windows server as part of this network right and log into that windows server enable active directory roles and start managing it so let me open up my uh, active directory or my windows machine which is actually part of uh, this particular domain so i already have a virtual machine which is joined to this particular network okay uh, again in case the screen sharing stops please do let me know because i'm using multiple screens um so i'm sure i'm uh, i hope everybody is able to see uh, the rdp session which i've opened up if not please do let me know in the chat so this is the windows server which is part of my uh, which which is part of my domain services network and here what i've done is i've gone ahead and enabled uh, a role right which is my uh, if i scroll down uh, if i go to my rdp uh, remote access i've gone ahead and enabled adds and adlds tools right on this machine now, because of that, if I go into Windows Administrative Tools and Users and Computers, I'm able to manage my virtual solution, which is actually uh, the domain, which uh, is which is my Azure AD domain services, right? So these are some of the default groups that get created: ADDs, domain administrators. Um, so these are some of the in, in, inside groups. If I open up the users. This, these are the default users that you see. And here I can go ahead and create an OU, right? So I can go ahead and create an organization unit. I can have group policies defined and anything that I define from here uh, will get applied to my domain services and everything associated to it. So the users, the devices, all of those things, right? So uh, Microsoft has made it very simple and easy because most of the administrators are used to this particular interface of managing Active Directory, right? So all you need is a simple virtual machine again this doesn't this virtual machine doesn't have to be up and running all the time right it's just an interface which you are familiar and from this interface you can manage domain services so whenever required you can start it you can use a very simple virtual machine like even a b series virtual machine uh, should be good enough for you to you or for you to manage and maintain your domain services so that is about domain services. Uh, last but not the least, I quickly want to cover about multi-factor authentication as well. Um, now, I've seen most of the partners already implement multi-factor authentication, so I'll not go into a uh, very detailed uh, demonstration for it, but I'll quickly show you where and how you can enable uh, multi-factor authentication. So if I click on users, you have this option saying multi-factor authentication here. So that will open up another, uh, page or another website where you can see which users have multi-factor authentication enabled which are not and when you enable or when you go ahead and activate multi-factor authentication for example if i search for a user saying mfa i should have a user saying mfa yeah so if i select this user i have two options i can go ahead and enable multi-factor authentication so it will the status will say enable but then I can also go ahead and enforce it. So what do I mean by enabled and enforced? So when I say enabled, by default, the user will have the default 14 days period to go ahead and sign himself up for uh, MFA, right? But if I enforce in the next login, he will be forced to go ahead and uh, put in his uh, multi-factor authentication, which is uh, activate either using a phone or SMS, and I can even define what are the multi-factor authentication options the users will get. So that is under service settings. So if I go under service settings, 
I can say the methods available for users. Text verification through mobile app or hard code. Um, this is the default uh, time when I can trust. I can even enable call to a phone. And these are three options that the users would get. I can also go ahead and skip multi-factor authentication for people who are part of an intranet. So for example, if a, if, if a person is trying to access an Azure resource from your company, from your company network, he comes to the office, logs into the computer from the office and tries, then tries to access, let's say, uh, an Azure website, right? You don't need to be multi-factored for him because you know that he is a legitimate user, he's into your office and then trying to access. So you can define safe networks or trusted networks from where people are not necessarily asked for authentication, multi-factor. So if people are accessing from home, you can ask them for multi-factor. Using VPN, you can do that. But from a safe network, which you know uh, is secure enough, you can definitely skip multi-factor. So those options are also available uh, within Azure AD. So if you have any questions, please feel free to use uh, uh, the Q&A or the chat. And I, would, like I said, I'll be reviewing it uh, during the demo, post the demo and answering them. So let me go back to the slides. Uh, let me go ahead and share my slides. My reading. Okay. So the next topic is identity protection. So we looked at uh, Azure AD. We looked at how users can be created. You can have a uh, user part of domain. You can have guest users. You can create groups. Uh, you can give them, uh, you can add the user into a group. You can assign an Azure role. For that user like a user administrator or a billing administrator or an application developer or global admin so there are several ro uh, roles available within azure uh, which which you can assign the user to uh, and then once all of this is taken care you still want to make sure you have uh, an a protection so that is where multi-factor authentication comes in but what if you want to take it to another level Right. The next level of uh, protection is where identity protection comes into place. Identity protection within Azure AD helps you with three very important tasks. The first one is it automates the detection of identity risks. So, for example, if any of your users are, let's say, signing in from untrusted locations, right? locations uh, where they are not supposed to log in. For example, you know that a user is based in Sydney, but uh, after uh, uh, every alternate day, you see him uh, signing in from a location in, let's say, China or Russia or uh, from US, right? So how can you uh, identify that and take care of that, right? Uh, also, not just user, but also sign in. You see that uh, a lot of users are signing in from uh, machines which are not provided by organization. Let's say they're signing in from Windows XP, which you have never rolled out, uh, or they're signing in from uh, an Ubuntu or a Linux operating system, uh, which, is not, uh, which is not recommended by a company. So how can you identify these, uh, these, uh, uh, these signals of user sign-in and uh, uh, user risk, and then have a mechanism around protection for it. That is what identity protection is about, right? So identity protection is again a service that Microsoft has. Similar to Azure AD, it's, it's a service that works with Azure AD because eventually a user is being authenticated with Azure AD. And the good part is it, most of the identity protection service is all self-driven, which means you don't have to uh, configure or, or tweak a lot of things. It's, it's all um, using artificial intelligence and intelligent graph data insight and giving you insights into anomalies. So what are the different, uh, let's say, anomalies or, or uh, risks that can be uh, identified within identity protection? 
So you can identify users who are signing in from anonymous IP. You can identify users with leaked credentials. So these days, uh, I'm sure most of you know, there have been cyber, uh, several cybersecurity attacks where uh, the username and passwords are exposed to the internet. They are actually written on the website. So Azure AD is intelligent enough uh, uh, to identify if your user credential is leaked or if you're signing in from an anonymous IP address. For example, if you're using a browser like Tor and signing in, it is able to detect that. It is able to detect uh, an impossible travel. So like I explained earlier today, uh, uh, if you are, uh, let's say I, I speak with you, you log in from Sydney uh, and after 15 minutes, you, you log in from uh, let's say Singapore or after 15 minutes, you log in from Russia, right? It's not, it's not possible to travel from uh, Sydney to uh, like a place like Singapore or Russia in 15 minutes. So it is able to identify this where uh, it knows that it is an impossible travel within the time frame that you're logging in. Signing in from infected devices. If your a machine is infected by malware because of bot agents, it's able to identify that. Sign in from unfamiliar locations. Sign in from IP addresses that have suspicious activities. So these are six uh, risks that are identified by Azure. And the best part is it gives you detailed reporting around these uh, six items. So it, uh, if I show you some of the snapshots, so for user risk, it shows you which user has been accessing, which user is a high risk, which user is a low risk. And based on that risk profile, you can actually go ahead and pose in conditions. So you can say if a user is high risk, I want him to reset his password. If a user is uh, signing in from, uh, or if, if a user is categorized as high risk, I want him to uh, uh, sign in from a registered device. So these are things that you can actually go ahead and configure, or you can even go ahead and block that user from signing in at all, right? So these are things that are available within the identity protection. So one is user risk, which is, you can think of it as a user rating, a user risk rating. And if he's highly rated, which is uh, he's, he's a high risk, then you can definitely go ahead and block his access, right? Same, same with respect to sign-in risk. So for example, if you have an application deployed and if somebody is accessing from accessing it using Internet Explorer version nine or version eight, which is, which is the version which was available like 10, 15 years ago. Or if, you, if somebody is accessing uh, an application using an Opera browser, which is not uh, something that your organization allows uh, people to use, then you can also use those uh, mechanisms from where are they signing in and then apply certain policies on them so that uh, your data or the user is not compromised. Right? So this is what identity protection does within Azure. Um, now, a, a very closely working service with identity protection is conditional access. Like I said earlier, if a user is flagged as high risk, you don't want uh, uh, an IT admin to manually keep checking whether a user is high risk or low risk and then manually go ahead and block him. You want certain automation, right? You want Azure AD to go ahead and automatically block a user if he's high risk, if he's medium risk, you want him to reset his password and also log in as multi-factor. So you want these types of automation to be available within Azure. And that is what conditional access gives. So conditional access is basically uh, giving you the option saying, if this condition matches, then what should be the action for it? So if a user is high risk, then block his access. If a sign in, if, if a user has a lot of sign in risks, then make sure he resets his password because his password might be leaked, right? So this is where conditional access works very closely, not just with identity protection, even with multi-factor authentication. Like I said, you can combine these various um, services into a very uh, detailed conditional access mechanism. So you can say, if a user is accessing from an IP which is not trusted, he should be uh, using only the client app and not a browser app. 
and only then he can have access to a certain system which is running in Azure. So you can have as detailed or as stringent policies as possible by using conditional access. So again, one of the common questions which I get is, how can I set which, I mean, based on what condition the user is a high risk, a user is a medium risk, or a user is a low risk. So is there a way within Azure that I can go ahead and categorize a user as a high or low or a medium, or can I define what are the parameters for heights? What are the parameters for sign-in risk, a high sign-in risk? The answer is no, you cannot define this. It is all artificial intelligence and machine learning based, right? Microsoft gets uh, login details of users, not only using Office 365, but Azure AD, but Dynamics 365. It also has information of people using Xbox and Hotmail and other MSN services. So based on this large data, it is able to identify if a user has a sign in this because his credential might be leaked in another part of the world altogether, right? That is how identity protection works. So it's not really under our control. And I'll quickly show you in the demo where you can go ahead and define what is uh, what categorizes as a high risk or what categorizes as a medium or a low risk. It is all artificial intelligence and machine learning based. So let's again, uh, quickly jump on uh, to a quick demo. And after the demo, I'll, I'll quickly look at some of the questions that you guys are putting in the chat. So again, I'm, I'm sharing uh, the screen. Uh, if, if you are not able to see the screen sharing, please do let me know. Uh, so here, if I close this and go back to... So uh, I'm sharing the screen now. Can can you all confirm or some of you confirm if you're able to see the Azure portal open up? Okay, wonderful. So, uh, so within Azure uh, portal, like I said, uh, the first thing is identity protection. So again, you can do a quick search or if you go into Azure AD as well, you can find it. So if I do a quick search, uh, I can see Azure AD privilege identity management. I can see identity governance. Uh, so if I click on identity governance, that is where the, the all these are part of governance uh, items within Azure, right? So within um, governance, I can see how I can go ahead and enable uh, certain uh, services of, of Azure. Uh, so let me actually go back, go into Azure AD and from here, if I go into security, so here I have all the documentations that are required for me to learn about identity protection, conditional access. And this is where if I click on identity protection, I can see a various information. Now, since it's a demo account, you'll not be um, seeing a lot of graphs and charts, but here I can see minimum risk users, identity secure score. So about identity secure score we'll be covering in the fourth day. So this is part of a service called as Azure Defender. Uh, since I've already enabled it, it is showing me here. Uh, but uh, this is where you can see all your user risk, sign-in risk, and all of these things, right? And you can also go ahead and configure user risk policy and sign-in risk policy, which means if a user is marked as a high risk, what should I do? If a user is marked as low risk, what should I do, right? And here you can see the report of risky users and risky sign-in. So a very detailed information is available. This is very useful for not only uh, uh, implementation team, but uh, even for IT support engineers. So if somebody says I'm unable to log in, you can quickly check a couple of things, whether um, he has the right access. And even though he has the right access, uh, maybe you have a policy in identity protection, which is blocking him because he's been, um, let, let's say, signing in randomly from multiple locations. Right. So if I go to user sign in risk, this is where I can create a conditional policy. So this is a conditional policy or condition access policy. I can say this condition or this policy, the user risk policy is for all the users except some of the users. So always, whenever you create conditional access, this is 
one of the best practices that I always recommend. Any policy that you create, make sure you have at least one or two users excluded as part of it. And these are very sensitive and very, uh, I would say, uh, high permission based users. So make sure, again, this username and password is not shared very secure, um, but make sure you always have one user outside the condition so that in case the condition blocks everyone, you still have one user who can log in and fix the issue. Okay. So here I've created for all users except one and user risk I've defined as medium and above. So any user uh, except that particular user, if he is medium and above, and if he's trying to access any controls of Azure, I want him to allow, but I want him to change his password first. So when he tries to access it, the the Azure goes ahead and uh, prompts to reset his password, right? And the same for sign in as well. So if a user is trying to sign in and if he's low and above, I can go ahead and block his access altogether. So I can go ahead either block or I can say allow, but I require him for multi-factor authentication, right? So I can go ahead, enforce this. So if it is off, it will only audit, right? It will only capture the information. But if, if I enforce it, it'll actually enforce this policy and make sure if a user is part of this or falls in this category, he is uh, enforced with this control, right? Now, uh, similarly, if I take a step back here uh, and if I go back, I'll also quickly show you uh, conditional access as well. So let me go back to Azure AD security and conditional access, right? So this is where I can define conditional access. So you saw two conditions based on user risk and sign in risk. Those are two conditions, but conditional access is not just limited to identity protection. You can go ahead and create a conditional access for pretty much any access to Azure service. For example, uh, one of the, the popular services that I've seen a lot of partners and customers using these days is Windows Virtual Desktop. It's again a service. So Let's go ahead and create a, a policy for it. So I'll say WED access policy, right? And here I'll say all users, say all users exclude uh, one particular user. Just put myself there, right? Uh, and I'll say cloud apps. So within the cloud apps, there are several applications of cloud, uh, but I'll go ahead and select the one that I need. So here it can also be Office 365. So let's say if you want people not to have access to Office 365 from every location, you can again use conditional access, right? So that is another way of how you can restrict user access. So I can, I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and enable it for Windows Virtual Desktop. This is the service, let's select. And condition, I'll say if a user is high or medium risk, and if his sign-in is also high or medium, I can even go ahead and select a device. So if he's using any of these devices, but for now I'll not use device. And if I'll say, if he is, um, I'm sorry, I'll say exclude, if he is from a trusted location. So I do not want him to, uh, uh, I do not want the condition to make use of users who are part of my trusted location and client apps, I can define the client apps. I can divide, divide, uh, even define the device state, which is in preview right now. But based on all these conditions, what should I do? If I grant him access, I say grant access, but require that the multi-factor authentication is enabled and require password change. Or I can even go ahead and say, make sure he's logging in from a device which is registered to Azure AD. So like you see, I can go ahead and customize my access policy to a very refined level and make sure that there is no uh, unauthorized access happening to my applications which are running in Azure, right? So all these things can be enabled. And here you can see enable report only on or off. So if I say report only, it's basically auditing, capturing all the logs. Uh, that gives you information of how users are interacting with Windows Virtual Desktop, which devices that they're using, how are they signing in. 
And then based on that, you can take an action saying, okay, I'll change a little bit of the policy and then I'll enforce it. So always start with the report only, capture the information and then go ahead and enforce it. So let me switch back to the slides. So let me see if there are a couple of questions. Uh, so there's a question saying is Azure AD and domain services backed up? Uh, so you don't have to worry about backup of Azure AD or domain services. It's a managed service of, uh, it's a managed service provided by Microsoft. So Microsoft takes care of backing it up, restoring it, making sure it's always up. Like I said, it's a global service. So it's, it's a service that's always up and running. So uh, there's another question from a partner saying, is it possible to uh, enable multi-factor authentication by default for a new user creation rather than manually enabling it? The answer is yes. You can again use policies to go ahead and enable multi-factor uh, for, for all the user uh, uh, as soon as the user gets created. That's, that's definitely pol uh, possible by using policies. Skip work. So there's another question saying, how does skip work for users on VPN, Azure AD Connect, but traffic is going through, um, is going out via home ISP. So uh, Nick, I'm assuming this is, you're talking about the trusted IPs. Uh, so the trusted IPs, you basically define an IP range, right? If a user is part of that IP range, um, then he basically gets skipped from a uh, multi-factor authentication, right? So whether it is VPN, your home ISP, your office network, you, you are basically defining it as a range. If your home IP is not part of that range, then he'll be multi-factor authenticated. So the IP that eventually uh, gets reported, uh, that, that, that is the originating point for Azure, right? That is what is taken into consideration. Can you restore Azure, uh, Active Directory yourself? Uh, say you accidentally deleted something, can you restore it? So yes, so there are certain options to restore. For example, you deleted a user, you deleted a group, can you restore it? Answer is yes. Those things are definitely possible within Azure. Anik, the answer is yes. So going back to my slides, so okay. So then the next one is talking about Azure governance. Now, uh, a lot of companies uh, who move to cloud want to make sure that their infrastructure uh, has the, the appropriate security features and mechanisms put in place. Now, when you talk about security, always remember it's a shared responsibility, which means there are certain things that Microsoft by default enables. For example, uh, the basic DDoS protection is provided by Microsoft throughout the Azure network, right? That's at the network level. The making sure nobody has unauthorized access to the physical servers within the Azure data center, that's again taken care by Microsoft. But at the same time, there are responsibilities uh, for you as an MSP or the customer who actually uses it, which is making sure that you uh, close the ports on the virtual machine or you open the right ports or uh, you do not uh, go ahead and uh, not enable multi-factor and have a credential leak, right? So these are services that you have to or the customer has to take responsibility of and make sure is implemented. Uh, Microsoft definitely provides you a lot of uh, services in order to implement it. So for example, this slide talks about the five important Azure governance services which are available, which you could use in order to make sure you have a, a proper governance, a, 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 a standardized security uh, measure implemented, not just across one customer, but across all your customers. That is where our Azure governance comes into play. So uh, in the next upcoming slides, I'll go into details of each one of them. Uh, and if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to use the Q&A or the chat. 
So what is management group? So uh, management group, think of it as the top most layer, the top most grouping layer, right? So for example, you if you are a company who has multiple subscriptions, right? And you want to have a policy uh, saying every user who is part of all these subscriptions should use Windows 10 uh, to access whether it is Office 365 or Azure services. And you want to you want it to be applied across multiple subscriptions. That is where management groups comes into play. So management group is basically a group which holds multiple subscriptions within it. And you can assign policies to the management group itself. Right. So um, that's why I said it's it's the top tier, the 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 uh, the first tier of grouping is where management resource come. Uh, sorry, management groups comes into place. So management groups provide you the option to manage uh, multiple sub management groups, and eventually it is a subscription. And within the subscription is where all your resources are, right? Like virtual machine and users and uh, storage, all of these things. So uh, going, so after uh, the management group, the other topic which I want to quickly cover is Azure AD admin roles and RBAC roles. Again, this is something that a lot of partners get confused with. So Azure AD roles is basically roles which allow you permissions to multiple resources within Azure. For example, a billing admin has access to all the cost management related services in Azure. So he has access to cost analysis. He can go and create budgets, which is like alerts and notifications. But the same user cannot go ahead and delete a user. He cannot go ahead and create a virtual machine, right? So he's restricted to certain activities which are pertaining to billing. Now there is RBAC. So RBAC is role-based access model. So this is basically read, write, edit, delete kind of permission. So if you want a particular user to have read access for storage, right? You have a blob storage where you have, let's say images stored and you want a user to have this read access, that is when you go ahead and use RBAC roles and not Azure AD admin roles. So think of admin roles as delegated admin roles, right? So within your organization, you might have an exchange administrator, a user administrator, a password administrator. So that is what is Azure AD roles. RBAC roles is read and write, right? So if this user has access to read and write a particular resource, that is what uh, RBAC roles stand for. So both of these definitely work very closely with each other. Like I said, you would have uh, admin roles uh, at a group management group level at the subscription level, but eventually to access a resource, they will also have RBAC roles assigned to them as well. Okay. The next difference I wanna quickly talk about is what is Azure policy and RBAC? Uh, now we just saw conditional conditional access. Conditional access is a, a service that uh, is triggered based on how the user is, let's say, signing in, right? But policy is based on how a resource is created or a resource is running. For example, within the subscription, you do not want your IT team to create uh, a G series virtual machine or a H series virtual machine. You want to restrict them from creating that. That is where you actually implement Azure policy, right? So uh, Azure policy is basically ensuring that the resources that are being created or will be created or which are already created follow a certain set of rules and regulations, okay? So that is what Azure policy is. And again, uh, during the demo, I'll, I'll show you a little more details into it. We also have something called as Azure Blueprint. Now this is a service which I strongly encourage a lot of my partners who want to start providing security service to their customers to implement. Azure Blueprint is basically a group of Azure policies which are mapped to certain uh, compliance uh, compliances, right? So for example, think of Azure policies 
uh, sorry, think of Azure Blueprint as uh, a rough sketch of how your environment should be created, right? So think of it as a network architecture or, or, a, or an infrastructure architecture where you want to say that, okay, I want to have X number of VMs of a certain configuration acting as a front end server. I want security between the front end and the application server. I always want the database server never to have access to the internet, right? So the, if you want to create a, 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 a group of policies and combine that into one unit, that is what is Azure Blueprint. So Microsoft has created a several Azure blueprints based on compliant, popular compliance uh, compliances. For example, uh, PCI, ISO 27000. There's also an inbuilt Azure security benchmark, which I, which I encourage all the partners to implement. So these are policies which once enabled will keep checking your infrastructure to make sure your infrastructure is... Uh, is compliant with these rules and regulations, right? So Blueprint basically, uh, you can define policy, you can define role assignment, you can define uh, whether it is assigned to an entire subscription or to a resource group. So it's a very, uh, I would say a very important part of governance, uh, which when implemented can provide a lot of value, especially in terms of making sure the infrastructure is compliant and the users are able to, uh, uh, the IT and the users are able to access um, and, and create stuff as recommended. Uh, the last point which I want to quickly cover is Azure Locks. Azure Locks is a service that will basically help you uh, lock a particular uh, resource within, uh, within Azure. So with this Azure Lock, they will not be able to delete. For example, if you have a database that you have created, you do not want uh, intentional or unintentional deletion of that database, right? At any point of time. So that is where Azure locks come in. So you can actually go ahead and lock that virtual machine or that particular resource so that it can not be deleted by any user. That is what is uh, the meaning of lock. So let us quickly jump on to uh, a quick demo and then we'll uh, look at the last topic for the day. So we spoke about Azure policies, right? So um, before I go to policy, a quick uh, snapshot of Azure management group. Again, this is a service, it's very simple. So you can go ahead and create a management group and add subscriptions into that management group. The idea is if you want policies to be assigned at the subscription level, and if you have multiple subscriptions, for example, like I have, I have created a, a management group called tenant group admin and I have all these five subscriptions and a sub uh, subscri uh, management group part of it. So I can actually go ahead and create policies and, and uh, rules for this management group, which is MPN management group, or I can go to a level above and create policies for tenant organization itself, right? So it's more of making sure you have a logical grouping of subscriptions to which you can go ahead and assign uh, rules and regulations. The other service which I spoke about was Blueprint. So if I go to Blueprints, and if I go to Blueprint definition, I quickly wanted to show you the various uh, Blueprints that are available. So if I click on Create Blueprint, so Blueprints can be created from scratch. So you can create a blank Blueprint and add all your policies within it, or you can use some of them which is already defined here, so, right? So you have Azure Security Benchmark, Australian Government, ISM Protected, you, are, you have CIS, uh, Azure Foundations, you have ISO, you have NIST, you have PCI. So a lot of companies are now uh, providing services, credit card services or applications which use credit card services and are hosted on Azure you can actually use PCI uh, service for it. So the, uh, and if I go ahead and see this, this will have a number of rules. So if I just say PCI, and this is where the definition location is. So I'm defining to what is it being applied to. So let's say I'll go ahead and select a particular management group and a subscription within it. So I'm assigning it at the subscription level. And these are the subset of policies that are already part of it. So 
some of them I can change, some of them I have to, I cannot change. For example, deploy threat detection on SQL servers. This is something that I cannot change, right? But for example, if I want to go ahead and say uh, PCI this one, this is uh, one of the policies within it. And again, if I search for this, it is all publicly published by Microsoft. So I can get into very detailed of what this policy is, what is it, do, what control mapping is it doing? So all of those details are available. So I can go ahead and enable this. So it is basically saying, should I collect logs from all these services or only some of the service? So let's say I wanna collect logs from all these services. If I wanna uncheck any of the service, I can do that. Again, trusted locations or allowed location where should I want to make sure that the resources get created? I want to make sure that all the resources which are created are only in Australia East or Southeast. I don't want resources to be created in, let's say, East US or, or in Japan, for example, right? I can go and define these, apply this at a subscription level so that my entire subscription is following these sort of rules and regulations, right? So that is what Azure uh, Blueprints is about. So jumping back to the slides, and this would be the last topic uh, for today. So uh, principles of zero trust. So making sure that you implement zero trust mechanism within Azure is the next security feature that a lot of customers are asking, right? Uh, and how can you implement zero trust? Zero trust is based on three basic principles you have to verify every item explicitly, whether it is user, location, device, you have to have a mechanism to explicitly verify whether uh, it is what it says, or if uh, if a user says he is Ben, verified either multi-factor, either conditional access, so have, a, have a, uh, uh, an explicit verification for it use least privileged access. So always make sure that people have minimum access or they can request access when they need it, right? So for example, if, if somebody wants to make certain changes to a virtual machine, you only give him contribute rights to the virtual machine for let's say two days or three days a week so that after that he's again back to read access, right? So make sure you always have just-in-time access uh, or just enough access provided to me. And always create um, policies or create alerts and notifications, assuming that you're always under attack so that you always verify every single thing. So these are three basic principles that if you implement, you'll have a very secure infrastructure. And the best part is Azure has all the services that you need in order to do that. So just by combining Azure Blueprints, conditional access, multi-factor authentication, identity protection, the things which we just discussed today, if you just implement those, you can actually go ahead and cover a big piece of implementing zero trust. Now we spoke so far about users, tip normal users, but it is also very important to have security around privileged users. Privileged users are your administrators, right? So they are users who have access to everything and anything. And whenever there is an attack, whenever uh, you uh, your system is compromised, the hacker is always looking for a privileged account, right? Because if he gets access to, let's say, a domain admin, he pretty much has access to the entire organization, right? So hence, it is very critical and important to have protection around um, privileged identity. And within Azure, privileged identity service, there is a service just for those users, right? So we can go ahead and enable just-in-time privileged identity. So if somebody wants to have admin access, we can only give them admin access for a certain duration, right? So which is time-bound. You can go ahead and ask for justification from the users. Why do they need it? Notify when the service is activated and notify when the service is deactivated. You can also go ahead and have an approval mechanism to give him privileged access, right? So if somebody is saying, I need to go ahead and make changes to uh, an entire resource group, 
and that resource group also has some of your production databases and application, you want to get the right approval, the right justification for it, right? Again, things like multi-factor can also be implemented. And the most important piece, whenever you implement uh, ac uh, privileged access, I'm sorry, privileged identity management, make sure you implement access reviews. What is access review? A lot of customers I've seen, they give privileged access, but they do not check whether the activity uh, is completed or do they really require privileged ac uh, access after let's say a month, right? So what access review does is it's an automated way of going ahead, sending out a uh, notification and asking for additional approval or additional uh, justification to why should they continue to have that service or why should they continue to have that privilege in order to do it, in order to continue to do the work. So access reviews is definitely very, very critical and important to implement uh, within identity access. Uh, we'll come back to the demo at the end of the session. The last one, which I want to quickly talk, and most of you are already aware of it, is hybrid identities. So again, for customers who have implemented Office 365, Microsoft 365, I'm sure you have been syncing your on-prem Active Directory to Azure Active Directory. There are multiple ways to go ahead and sync your on-prem Active Directory to Azure Active Directory. There is pass, uh, password hash, which is the most common way of using. What password hash does is it basically goes ahead and passes or moves both your username and password in an encrypted format. So your password is double hashed and moved into Azure AD, right? So your authentication of user is directly happening in Azure AD itself. Your authentication request doesn't come back to your on-prem active directory. If you are an organization who wants to make sure you want the user authentication to happen back in the Active Directory, in your on-prem. Let's say you, you are a organization where you do not want the password to be sent out from the organization at all, whether it is double hash, you still want to be absolutely secure and make it available within the company itself, then you can use pass-through authentication. So pass-through authentication, you actually install an agent in your on-prem Active Directory and that agent, only can receive requests from Azure AD. It cannot send anything. It can only receive requests from Azure AD and it can authenticate uh, based on your uh, username and password. So in uh, when you use pass-through authentication, the username is definitely in Azure AD, but passwords are never stored in Azure AD. It is only stored in on-prem active directory. The last but not the least is ADFS. Uh, I've not really seen a lot of implementations of ADFS in the in the um, in the in the last few months or the last uh, six to eight months at least. But ADFS is a mechanism where let's say if you have different identity providers and if you want single sign-on across all these various identity providers, then you implement ADFS. So ADFS you will actually implement additional servers on which ADFS role will be running. And you'll actually use that to go ahead and provide single sign-on access to uh, multiple applications, which understand different authentications. So this is a quick decision tree. Again, I'll be sharing the slide. Uh, you can use this uh, decision tree as a reference uh, whenever you go ahead and decide which is the right authentication mechanism for my customer. So, uh, sorry, I, I think I ran over time, uh, but quickly want to summarize what we covered today. So we looked at Azure AD, uh, we looked at how different is it from domain services and Windows Active Directory. We looked at multi-factor authentication. We looked at uh, user and sign-in risk. We looked at uh, various policies that you can create such as blueprints and locks. We also spoke about why privileged identity and access management is important. And at the last, we looked at what are the various ways of how you can implement password hash. I'm sorry, how, how you can implement hybrid identities. So hybrid identities are identities which are synced from your on-prem Active Directory to Azure AD, right? So that is hybrid. If a user account is directly created in cloud, they are called as cloud identity, right? So hybrid identity is on-prem syncing to Azure and something which is already there, you directly create in cloud, it is called as cloud identity. So that pretty much brings us to the end of today's session. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time.
Before I close the session, I quickly want to go ahead and post a couple of quiz questions. Uh, these are questions which you have to participate in order to win that uh, Star Trek Sabre that we are giving out as a, as a prize. So the first question is uh, appearing on your poll. So uh, go through the question. So the question is, if you plan to implement Azure AD Connect to integrate on-prem Active Directory with Azure AD, and you need to satisfy the following two conditions, right? Policy, password policies and user logon restrictions should be synced and use minimum number of servers. What option would you use? Would you use pass-through, would you use federation or would you use pass-through authentication? Okay, I'm just waiting for other people to participate. In the meanwhile, let me see if there are any questions. Uh, Mark, that's a good question. Uh, if you want to get a list of customers who have not enabled MFA, is it possible to get from Partner Center? Uh, Mark, if you can drop me an email, my email address is displayed on the screen. Uh, I can double check, but I'm, I'm not aware if there is a way from Partner Center to get that, but I can double check and get back to you. Okay, let me end the polling here. So uh, I see a lot of people have participated. Um, there have been uh, answers for all of all the three. Uh, the right answer is password hash synchronization with seamless single, uh, single sign-off. Uh, so the first one is wrong. I'm sorry, the, uh, using AD federation services is wrong because you the one of the requirement is use minimum number of servers. For federation, you will actually go ahead and deploy additional servers. So that's definitely not. Pass-through authentication will not sync your policy passwords, right? So the right answer is password hash synchronization. Uh, the second question is popping up right now. Uh, please do participate in this. Uh, this is also one of the questions posted on, on the Q&A, so I had not wanted to answer, uh, go ahead and read it out. So which Azure AD plan includes Azure AD identity protection? So is it free? Is it part of your basic, which is part of your Office 365, Microsoft 365? Uh, is it part of P1 or P2? So just wanted to quickly uh, put this out there and uh, make sure everybody has an understanding around it. Okay, I'd appreciate if everybody can quickly participate. Again, like I said, these are questions that we'll, we'll have in every session. And at the end, we'll pick up uh, uh, people who have answered right and then uh, have a lucky draw on who will win the prize. Okay, I'll just give another three minutes, three seconds for people to participate. Okay. So the right answer is Azure AD Plan 2 or Premium Plan 2. That is the plan which includes identity protection, right? So the user sign in risk and uh, user risk and sign in risk, sorry. This is available within identity plan too, okay? So that concludes our session for today. Uh, thank you very much for sticking around. Uh, I know I went uh, over time by 15, 20 minutes. So thank you again for, for um, staying on and, and going through the session. We'll have similar sessions planned every Thursday for the next three weeks. Please do join them. We will be talking about uh, in depth about all other Azure security topics. And if you have any questions, you have my email address displayed on the screen. Please feel free to shoot me an email. I'll be more than happy to get on a call offline and help you with your questions. Um, so thank you very much. If you don't have any questions, this brings us to end of session. If you do have any questions, I will be on the chat for the next 15 minutes. So please do go ahead, post your questions in the chat or the Q&A, and I'll go ahead and answer them for you. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Have a great week ahead.